This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. Um, Bob has asked me to um, introduce Al Sinousis. Um, and um, it's a really great pleasure that uh, we welcome Al uh, to give Cardiology Grand Rounds here. Um, and the title of this talk is Multimodality Imaging and Molecular Imaging of Cardiac Remodeling. Um, as you can see, um, Al is a professor of diagnostic radiology and medicine, um, as well as director of the Advanced Cardiovascular Imaging Center, director of the Yale Translational Research Imaging Center. And Al holds a number of other important titles that um, speaks to his um, unique status as a clinician investigator. Um, he is um, director of um, the Yale Translational Research Imaging Center. Um, ever since I was at Yale as a fellow, he's been very, very involved in nuclear cardiology there. And um, in uh, 2012, he took over as director of nuclear cardiology at Yale. Many of you know that uh, much of the clinical nuclear cardiology that's used and developed around the world uh, was initiated at Yale, and we have our own Ernie Garcia, who's here, who's uh, been very involved with that, but um, Al now leads that uh, program. So in addition to being a superb clinician, um, Al's uh, track record at the NIH is, is really spectacular. He currently um, is a permanent standing member of the uh, medical imaging study section. Um, he was a um, permanent member of the CICS section um, and has had funding uh, from the NIH for many, many years looking at cardiovascular remodeling, imaging, um, and other translational uh, aspects of molecular imaging. One thing I found fascinating is that, uh, true to his leadership abilities, um, if you look at his, the patents that he holds, um, he's collaborated very, very closely with electrophysiologists at Yale, interventional cardiologists, as well as imaging uh, molecular folks um, and engineers. Um, and um, his contributions to the section there and also to the national scene um, are highlighted by the fact that he's uh, on the board of directors of the Society of Nuclear Medicine, the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. He's currently associate editor of the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology. Um, and um, I, I have to say that when I was a fellow at Yale from 90 to, I guess, 94 to 99, Al was instrumental in um, inspiring me to get in, interested in flow and in uh, myocardial uh, metabolism, myocardial uh, biomechanics. Um, and um, he was a spectacular and inspiring teacher. Um, he really personified discipline, perseverance, and, um, and, and that sort of academic pursuit of uh, working extremely hard, teaching. He was one of the best teachers we, we ever had. So it's really with great pleasure that we welcome Al uh, to come down and, and share with us some of his interests. Well, thanks, Habib, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, <clears throat> present some of the work we're doing on multimodality uh, Cardiovascular imaging as it relates to remodeling. Uh, this is my disclosures. I do get support from industry and a number of NIH projects. Uh, so let me start out with an introduction of molecular imaging. And molecular imaging is the visualization, characterization, and measurement of biological process at the molecular and cellular level in humans and uh, living systems. And molecular Im imaging allows us um, to sort of personalized care by characterizing specific disease processes in a given individual. And I think the future really is in the area of theranostics, and that is the integration of nanomedicine and molecular imaging. So linking a diagnosis to therapy. Uh, so as a kind of an overview of cardiovascular molecular imaging as it relates to ischemic heart disease, I have outlined sort of the progression from atherosclerosis uh, to plaque rupture, to ischemia, to infarction, and then, depending on the extent of the infarction, LV remodeling. And 
there are a number of uh, processes that are involved in that remodeling. Uh, there's early inflammation, thrombosis, apoptosis, necrosis, and fibrosis. And traditionally, uh, we've tracked sort of the endpoints. We've looked at the physiologic consequences. We've looked at the anatomic changes. And the goal with molecular imaging is to detect some of the molecular events and signals that precede uh, the manifestation of physiologic changes. And so there are a number of targets that one can look at, and, and, and one can do that with any of a number of imaging modalities. The most sensitive one are the radio tracer-based ones, SPECT and PET. Um, and there are important repair processes that we've investigated, angiogenesis, arteriogenesis, although I don't have time to talk about that today. So just as a review, <clears throat> with myocardial infarction, this is a, sort of an illustration of what was described many, many years ago, sort of the wavefront uh, progression of myocardial infarction with coronary occlusion, there's an ischemic risk area, and then the infarct area progresses from the endocardium to the epicardium. And that infarct is a function of the area at risk, um, the time of the occlusion, and the loading conditions, of course. And so uh, one starts with myocardial injury, and then there's uh, necrosis, inflammation, there's uh, fibroblast proliferation and transdifferentiation, and there's important alterations in the extracellular matrix. And this results in, in cardiac remodeling. And the remodeling process is a complicated process. It involves a number of steps. Uh, there's inflammation, there's release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, there's activation of MMPs and tissue inhibitors of MMPs, and, uh, and then there's neurohormonal regulation. And so many things get turned on and turned off, and the idea is can we use molecular imaging to track those events as they occur and use those, that imaging, to actually direct uh, therapeutic interventions. So as we know, uh, with myocardial infarction, there's infarct expansion. That infarct places the remote areas at a mechanical disadvantage, and we have global remodeling. And there's <clears throat> an important role of the extracellular matrix, which not only provo provides a support structure, but also is a depot for a lot of signaling molecules, cytokines, and growth factors, an important role of integrins which modulate the communication between the extracellular matrix and this complicated intracellular cascade of events. And then there's the role of matrix metalloproteinases. And I'm going to talk a lot about MMPs. So there are many uh, MMPs, uh, and there are different classes of MMPs, and uh, they have a number of important functions with regard to altering the extracellular matrix. Shown here are just a few of the ones that are, have been shown to be involved in the remodeling process. Uh, so MMPs uh, may be released as uh, pro-enzymes, and then they're acted upon by other proteases, and then uh, those uh, activated MMPs then degrade the matrix. But they're kept in check by uh, tissue inhibitors of MMPs, and the, and the remodeling of the extracellular matrix is really the balance between MMP activation and TIMP activation. <clears throat> and there are uh, a number of TIMPs as well, uh, uh, TIMP 1 through 4, and they also have uh, a number of effects affecting uh, growth proliferation, apoptosis, uh, cytokine processing, fiber, fibroblast transdifferentiation, and uh, they interact with a, a range of the MMPs. And uh, the one I'm going to talk about later is, uh, is TIMP 3. So, for many years, I've been collaborating with Frank Spinelli at the University of South Carolina, and, um, and he has been a pioneer in the area of looking at post-infarct remodeling. And uh, shown here is some of the work that he did early on in a pig model of myocardial infarction, demonstrating uh, the important role of MMPs, and that in inhibition of MMPs improves the post-infarct remodeling process. <clears throat> As I said, um, there's an important balance between MMPs and TIMPs, and, and that's related to the turnover of the extracellular matrix. Uh, there can be ventricular thinning, increased wall stress, infarct expansion, LV dilatation, and then that leads to clinical heart failure. Uh, and, the, and this TIMP-MMP balance is critical to the whole process. So as you know, uh, heart failure re is results when there's a defective pump function and filling, and this is really the final clinical manifestation of this complex cascade of uh, events and repair that occurs. 
and it is associated with obviously significant morbidity, mortality, and a, and a huge financial burden to society. And, um, and so we need to sort of optimize medical therapies and perhaps uh, molecular imaging will facilitate that. So again, uh, you know, heart failure is a vicious cycle. There's a number of processes that get activated and then the LV dysfunction sort of results in pressure overload, which makes, you know, the heart failure worse, and sort of it's a vicious cycle, and we need to try to interrupt that. Uh, there are a number of uh, predictors that we use. Traditionally, we looked at changes in geometry, changes in function. We know that LV volume in itself is a predictor of outcome in patients following myocardial infarction, and so end diastolic volume is an important index. Uh, there are a number of studies that have suggested that uh, even measuring peripheral biomarkers might be helpful in evaluation of the turnover of the extracellular matrix. And so shown here is one study, uh, which is the REV2 study, uh, which is a multicenter study in patients who presented with first uh, myocardial infarction. They had serial echocardiography and they had evaluation of serum biomarkers. Uh, they looked specifically at type 1 collagen, uh, telopeptide, ICTP, which is a biomarker of collagen degradation. They looked at PINP, uh, which is a biomarker of collagen synthesis, um, and at P3NP. And then they also looked at the more standard markers, BNP. And they looked at sort of uh, whether these values were low or high. And, uh, and then they looked at uh, sort of LV remodeling in relationship to just these circulating markers. And both of these markers are uh, indicative of uh, increased incidence of LV modeling. So if you, the more collagen turnover you have, more likely you're going to dilate your ventricle, the higher the VMP, more likely uh, you're going to develop LV dilatation. And they're sort of independent indices of that uh, risk of uh, adverse LV remodeling. Now Frank Spinelli's group <clears throat> in a early small clinical study also demonstrated that just measuring MMPs and the change in, in MMP release early post-MI also is predictive of post-infarct remodeling and showed that a change in, in particular MMP9 uh, was associated with a change in left ventricular and diastolic volume following myocardial infarction. And, and so, you know, clearly there are some serum biomarkers that can be used that predict that remodeling process. But what we'd like to do is actually know what's going on in the heart. And so we have, uh, in collaboration with a number of industrial partners, uh, looked at uh, radio-labeled probes that allow us to look at specific MMP activation within the heart itself. And so shown here are, are in the early probes we used, which were indium-labeled probes. And uh, these are uh, radio-labeled MMP inhibitors that bind to the active catalytic domain of MMPs. And so they really give us an in vivo index of the balance of MMP and TIMPs. Uh, and we've more recently been using a, a technesium label compound, which is called RP805. And uh, this has, this 805 is a broad spectrum MMP inhibitor. So it gets a wide range of the MMPs in the nanomolar, uh, with nanomolar affinity. Um, and so the, the ones that in particular we're looking at, MMP2, 3, 7, 9, 12, 13, and some of the TACE uh, agents. And this, these are all been shown to be involved in post-infarct remodeling. So we started out looking at a, at a mouse model of myocardial infarction. So we created uh, ligation in the anterior wall, including the anterior coronary artery, and shown here is a rat, a mouse heart, following myocardial infarction, and this is a normal control mouse. And you can see that there is enormous uh, dilatation and thinning of the left ventricle. In fact, we fill these heart with alginate, and you can see the alginate right through the wall because the wall is so thin. And we applied uh, hybrid micro-spec CT imaging to track uh, changes in perfusion and changes in MMP activation in these uh, rodent models of myocardial infarction. And so shown here, is a hybrid uh, micro-spec CT image in a mouse. This is a sham-operated animal and an animal one and three weeks following myocardial infarction. And what we found is with any of these molecular imaging agents, they create focal hotspots, and it's almost impossible to reconstruct these images without a reference. So we pair the targeted molecular image with a physiologic image like perfusion. 
And so in this case, we have a technetium labeled imaging that it, that's looking at MMP activation, and we pair that with a per, thallium perfusion. So we see a perfusion defect, and we see MMP activation. Uh, and this is a surgical model, and so to get that infarct, we have to do a thoracotomy. And obviously, there's inflammation and there's repair in the chest wall. And so, and the chest wall sits right over the heart. And so it's important that we have 3D imaging so that we can separate that wound from the activity in the heart. And you can see in the sham operated animal, we only see MMP activation in the, in the chest wall at the site of the thoracotomy, where the other animals demonstrate MMP activation throughout the heart. <clears throat> following myocardial infarction. Now, in collaboration with Frank Spinelli, we've looked at a number of transgenic animals. And, and this one was, uh, I guess, one of the ones that was most insightful or led us to some sort of novel pathways or, or, or investigative pathways. And he created a, a model of MT1 overexpression. And he demonstrated that uh, in these overexpressing animals, uh, that if you created infarction, there was a very high incidence of heart failure and myocardial rupture. Um, and so what, what we did was we used, and, and the important thing to notice that in these overexpressing mice, there was dilatation of the ventricles, but also importantly, dramatic dilatation of the atria of the heart. And I'll show you how uh, that may be important uh, in some of the MMP imaging that we're doing. So we demonstrated first that using our radiolabel compound that the overexpressors of MT1 had two times the uptake of our radio tracer. And then when we created infarction, they had a accelerated or an augmented uptake of our tracer, which was related to the increased uh, activation of, uh, of the MMPs uh, and MT1 in particular in these animals as assessed by immunoblotting and zymography. So we wanted to move then to a, a more clinically relevant uh, large animal model. And in our lab, uh, we have a very unique uh, 64 slice CT scanner that's married with a solid state nuclear detector. And so uh, this system has 180 degrees of solid state detectors. It has about five times the sensitivity of a conventional spec camera about twice the resolution, has better energy discrimination, and allows us to do dynamic imaging. Uh, and in clinically, it allows us to do this at reduced radiation to the patient. And so uh, what we end up with is uh, a series of projections. Uh, there are 19 detectors distributed over uh, 180 degrees, and we create a three-dimensional image. And then uh, we superimpose that nuclear image on a CT image so that we can do non-uniform attenuation correction. And these are the kinds of images that we can obtain with that system. So in this case, we're looking at a lesion in the circumflex coronary artery, and we can marriage that with perfusion imaging. And obviously, this is something that Ernie and his group have been doing for years. Um, and so, and we think that there is significant merit to bringing together that anatomic information with functional or molecular information. <clears throat> so, in a, in a large animal pig model, we created myocardial infarction by occlusion of uh, two marginal branches of the circumflex. And then we looked at animals at one, two, and four weeks following myocardial infarction. We imaged them with our MMP targeted compound, RP805. We imaged them with thallium to look at perfusion, and we did MR imaging to look at changes in mechanics and, and LV uh, size. And uh, shown here are some of the images. Again, this is a surgical model. And so again, we saw inflammation at the site of the surgery. Uh, and here you can see uh, images at one week, two weeks, and four weeks in the transaxial, coronal, and sagittal view. And you can see that there is a perfusion defect and associated with the perfusion defect is focal uptake of MMP within that area of injury. And that, uh, that perfusion defect persists, but the MMP activation declines over time. And we can uh, take these hearts out and cast them and cut them up, and, and we get a very nice, uh, in this model, transmural uh, infralateral infarct. Shown here are the perfusion images. Shown here are the MMP images. And shown here are the fused images, color-coded. And so then we cut up the hearts into, uh, into small segments, and then we count the radioactivity. And if you go in a, in a kind of circumferential direction counterclockwise, you can see 
as you go around the heart, the decrease area of perfusion relates to the increased area of MMP activation. And when we looked at a, a large series of animals, we found that in the infarct area, there was about a six to eight fold increase in MMP activity. There was about a two fold increase in the remote areas of the heart as well, because remodeling is a global process. And we found that we can't just look at relative activity, we have to look at absolute activity. And so we need to kind of correct for attenuation and scatter, partial volume effects, uh, and we need to express that uptake as a percent of the injected dose. And so uh, we initially looked at the MMP uptake uh, relative uh, to thallium perfusion, and, and shown here are the results for animals at one, two, and four weeks following myocardial infarction. And again, you can see that uh, the perfusion defect doesn't really change, but we have a, a change in that MMP activation. Um, and the idea would, can we use that to monitor therapeutic interventions? And so then we validated this in vivo imaging with post-mortem analysis. And this is work, again, that was supported by Frank's group in South Carolina, uh, where we looked at the spatial distribution of our radio tracers uh, in relationship to MMP9 activity, MMP2, MMP7, and MT1. And you can see that uh, there was, uh, again, this tracer tracks global activation of MMPs. It's not specific for any one MMP. But we did find a fairly good relationship with MMP2. And so this is the uptake of our compound, uh, RP805 versus MMP2. And then this is the relationship between MMP our, the uptake of our compound and subsequent LV dilatation. Now, we wanted to relate MMP activation to changes in mechanics, and so we used MR imaging to compute regional strains in the heart. And we did this through a novel approach that involves uh, 3D image analysis, where we tracked points on the surface of the heart based on their energy of curvature. And so we have displacements for thousands of points on the inner surface of the heart and the outer surface of the heart, tracking their curvature. And then we incorporate those displacements into a finite element analysis, assuming a certain fiber architecture. And then I'll show you, we actually use this to, and then we, we actually uh, defined what the fiber architecture was in these hearts. And so in this, these maps, red, is, red and yellow is thickening or increase in wall thickness and uh, Blue and green is shortening, and so you can see circumferential shortening and, and thickening in the radial direction, but in the infarct area, we have bulging. So then we wanted to specifically relate those changes in strain to the changes in regional MMP activation. And, the, and shown here is just the relationship between radial strain and MMP activity. Again, <clears throat> looking at the infarct in, in red, the border zone in orange, the remote areas in yellow, and then control animals. And these are animals at one, two, and four weeks following myocardial infarction, looking at the temporal changes in mechanics. So MMPs can be released through an inflammation, but they also can be mechanotransduced. And, and our initial thought was that we'd see activation in the infarct, and then the border zone, and then the remote zones. But in fact, what we saw was global activation early on, and then a recovery of that activation over time. Um, so shown here is an MR technique called uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, and that looks at uh, free water movement or diffusivity. And so uh, following myocardial infarction, there's MMP activation, and then there's structural disruption, and there's increased free water movement. And so one sees increased uh, diffusivity and less anisotropy. So there's less directionality of the water movement as you disrupt the fiber ar architecture, and there's more sort of random water movement. <clears throat> so using this approach, one can actually uh, define the fiber architecture in the heart. And, and what see, one, one sees is there's an oblique, oblique fiber architecture in the outer wall, in the mid wall it becomes circumferential, and the inner wall becomes oblique in the other direction. And so now we've defined in a given heart what the fiber architecture is. So we do in vivo imaging of strain, and then ex vivo we take the hearts, and then we do a eight hour scan to define the fiber architecture. Then we take that fiber architecture and we morph it in to the in vivo image and then translate and express those deformations in the fiber direction and the cross fiber direction with the idea that the cross fiber strains are going to be related to alterations and activation of the matrix metalloproteinases. 
And so we end up with color-coded maps <coughs> of radial strain, circumferential strain, longitudinal strain, but also cross-fiber strain and fiber strain. Um, and so, you know, now we're in the process of sort of relating those cross-fiber strains uh, to regional activation of MMPs. Now, other groups have been looking at this change in fiber architecture, and this is work from the group at the Mass General, uh, where they show, uh, similar to we did, that the fiber course changes in a human heart uh, in a normal sheep, but then interestingly, this is the fiber architecture in the remote area of a sheep, or the remote in, uh, myocardium of a sheep following myocardial infarction. So demonstrating that within in myocardial infarction, there is alteration in the fiber architecture in the infarct, but there's also alteration in the fiber structure in the remote areas of the heart. And this is related to that heart becoming more globular in shape. Um, so people have used this kind of imaging, uh, looking at SCAR, looking at fiber architecture, actually model what would be electrical activation in the heart. And the group uh, at Hopkins has sort of validated that with invasive measures. So there are implications of this kind of imaging uh, for EP uh, sort of evaluations and therapeutic interventions. Now, uh, we talked about, and, and uh, we're, our group has been particularly interested in atrial fibrillation, in part because of those early experiments where we demonstrated this dramatic remodeling of the atria following myocardial infarction. And so in reviewing the literature, there are some studies that looked at MMP activation and TIMPS uh, in relationship to the recurrence of atrial fibrillation following cardioversion. And so these are these receiver operator curves uh, demonstrating what are the predictive value of just measuring circulating levels of MMP9 and MMP3 or some selected TIMPS. And you can see that the, these biomarkers were predictive of the response to cardioversion while just assessment of atrial size wasn't. There's also uh, literature that, that demonstrated in patients that were going to surgery that had either no history of AFib or paroxysmal AFib or continuous AFib. They took out a, a atrial appendage at the time of surgery, and then they looked at uh, MMP9 activity, and those that were in chronic AFib had elevated MMP9 levels. Those that were in paroxysmal AFib had it at an intermediate elevation of MMP9, um, and that this activation of these MMPs was related to changes in, in left atrial geometry. So a, a common practice now is to do MR uh, gadolinium uh, enhanced imaging to evaluate uh, fibrosis in the atrium, and people have shown that fibrosis in the atrium is predictive of response to therapeutic interventions. The problem is, is that that's too late in the game. Once fibrosis is present, there's nothing you can do. And the clinical trials uh, <clears throat> that have tried to impart pharmacological therapy, they've only been effective in preventing AFib in those patients who've never had AFib. Once you have AFib, uh, things like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers don't prevent AFib, only it's sort of primary prevention. And so we've done some high resolution uh, in vivo imaging and ex vivo imaging to look at sort of that scar formation, and relating that fibrosis to our 3D maps of MMP activation. So shown here is uh, one of our uh, in, uh, in vivo pig images. We're looking at MMP activation in red in the infarct area, but notice that there's dramatic MMP activation in the atria of the heart. Uh, we, we looked at pigs at different time points. If under normal conditions, if we do rapid atrial pacing to try to put a pig into atrial fibrillation, we cannot do it. But following myocardial infarction, uh, we can pretty successfully put them into atrial fibrillation. We think that their susceptibility to atrial fibrillation is related to MMP activation and atrial remodeling. And we think that we can predict that susceptibility before the onset of fibrosis, at the point when they just have that early MMP activation. Um, and so what we found when we looked at, uh, did well counting actually of, of these hearts, we found as before about a six to eight fold activation of MMPs in the infarct, about a two fold activation in the remote areas of the ventricle, but about a four fold activation of MMPs in the atria of the heart. Uh, and then, again, in collaboration with Frank Spinelli's group in South Carolina, we did careful characterization 
of the tissue, uh, looking at collagen content and a number of other markers that I'll show you. And we saw time-dependent changes uh, in uh, collagen content and collagen disarray before there was uh, frank fibrosis. And the interesting thing was that there was an increase in, in the left atrium, but a decrease in the right atrium. And we think, well, maybe it's this heterogeneity that's the substrate for, uh, for atrial fibrillation. And we looked at a number of other markers, again demonstrating regional heterogeneity of both matrix structure, uh, uh, proteins, and markers. So here we're looking at MMPs, and we're looking at collagen, TH, TFG beta, TGF beta. And you can see that some areas are going up, some areas are going down, uh, and as indicated by sort of the, the red and blue uh, color. We also looked at cytokine expression. Uh, and indices of fibroblast phenotype, and these are shown here. And again, there was this heterogeneous change uh, within these hearts. Now, the interesting thing, the observation we've made with our MMP imaging is that it particularly lights up in the atrial appendage. And the atrial appendage, I think, is almost like a pop-off valve or pressure overload. That's where you see the greatest uh, sort of remodeling early on. And interestingly, a group in Calgary uh, did uh, careful maps of uh, regional wall stress and actually found that the greatest stress points were in the atrial appendage, which is the exact area where we see uh, the most activation of these MMPs. Now, as I said, in order for this to become practical clinically, we have to be able to quantify the, the uptake of these tracers in vivo. And that requires a, a lot of uh, image processing. And so shown here, is an image of an infarcted heart where we've injected MMP. Uh, and we don't really see uh, a dramatic increase in MMP activation. That's because the infarct is so thin that there's a significant partial volume effect, that you underestimate the activity when the wall is, is thin. So first, <coughs> we did a resolution recovery, and that's what's shown here. Then we did a correction for partial volume. And you can see that there was a significant activation of MMP. Then we cut up the hearts and actually mapped out the MMP act activity that was in the tissue and then related the image activity versus the tissue count counting. And that's what's shown here in this curve. So when we apply the appropriate corrections for attenuation and scatter and partial volume, we can get an accurate in vivo estimate of the absolute uptake uh, within regions of the heart. Now, in order to do that, you need to know where the endocardial and the epicardial surface is, and then that means you need to do CT or MR. And we already are giving radiation, and so we want to minimize radiation. And so what we're working on is trying to get that information off of low-dose, low-contrast CT scans. So right now, we're able to define the endo and epicardial surfaces of the heart with a 50MA uh, scan uh, and only about... Uh, 20 or 30 cc's of contrast. So with very low dose CT and low dose contrast, we can get enough information to define the surfaces of the heart so we can do partial volume correction. Okay, now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, a novel therapeutic intervention because you could say, okay, well, that's nice. You can map MMPs, but how's it going to change any therapy? What, what therapy are you going uh, to implement? Well, there is some early data that suggests that doxycycline post-myocardial uh, infarction may prevent LV remodeling. And this is the results of a uh, phase two randomized clinical trial in patients with uh, ST elevation MI, depressed EF, uh, after primary PCI that were randomized to doxycycline uh, which, uh, for seven days, which is an inhibitor of MMP9 and 2. And then they looked at the changes in LV uh, size uh, in those that didn't get doxycycline and those that did, and you can see that there was a decrease in, in LV dilatation in this clinical trial. And then they also related the change in dilatation to the original defect size, and they did that with SPECT imaging, and they show here for every different defect in size, there was less dilatation uh, in those patients that received the doxycycline. Now, there was one clinical trial that used an MMP inhibitor that was went bust, but maybe they gave the wrong dose for the wrong time for the wrong duration. And so the idea was, could we, be, could we use this imaging to actually optimize a therapeutic intervention? Now, there are also uh, a whole host of 
uh, centers uh, looking at the administration uh, locally of hydrogels or polymers into the infarct region to alter regional mechanics and also to do local cell gene therapy or, or drug delivery. And there are many uh, natural and synthetic hydrogels that have been used in, in preclinical models uh, following myocardial infarction. Here I just shown some of the natural hydrogels and some of the synthetic hydrogels that people are applying in the setting of post-infarct remodeling. And just here's another list of uh, a number of the trials and the different agents and how they're being injected and when they're being injected. You can see that every trial is different and, and we don't know how much polymer to give and when to give the polymer and how to follow the efficacy of that. And so perhaps having imaging, we could track these novel polymer, polymer therapies. And the idea is that you inject this polymer and then this polymer degrades and slowly releases drug uh, there are polymers that are only activated or broken down in the presence of MMPs and then release TIMPs locally when the polymers are broken down. Um, and so one can do targeted uh, local drug delivery. And this has been done in sheep. I'm just going to show you an example or two uh, where they used uh, alginate hydrogel in a pig uh, given early post myocardial infarction. You can see the alginate within the infarct early on, and then this just breaks up and then is gone within six or eight weeks following infarction. But in the early post-infarct period, it stiffens up the wall and prevents that adverse LV remodeling and the altered mechanics. And they showed that there was less dilatation in the pigs that got, the, in this case, an intracoronary administration of a calcium-sensitive polymer. So this, they inject it down the coronary post-MI. Uh, it leaks into the tissue in the presence of calcium in the infarct. It complexes and stiffens up the wall. And they, they actually have, this uh, did go to an early clinical trial um, in 27 patients that had moderate and large ST elevation MI following primary angioplasty. They gave this down the coronary artery and they didn't show any clear benefit, but they also didn't show any adverse effects, arrhythmias or death or, uh, or complications associated with this. So this was sort of an early proof of principle or safety trial in man. Uh, and there are many of these now ongoing. <clears throat> So now I talked briefly about uh, TIMPs. I want to in particular talk about TIMP3, uh, which uh, can modulate MMP activity uh, and alter uh, sort of uh, apopto apoptosis pathways and matrix degradation and sort of modulate the remodeling process. In particular, MMP3 uh, changes the pro-inflammatory status of macrophages. So uh, when uh, TIMP3 is present, you have sort of the, the beneficial uh, non-pro-inflammatory uh, uh, neutrophils sort of released. In the absence of TIMP3 in these transgenic animals, uh, you have sort of, uh, sort of increase in, in M1 uh, macrophages. And, the, and people have shown that, uh, that uh, knockout of TIMP3 is associated with uh, adverse remodeling. And so this is just a mouse model where uh, if you don't have TIM3, they end up with bigger infarcts and more LV dilatation. So uh, Frank's group in collaboration with a group in, at University of Pennsylvania have been, uh, at the time of infarction, administering into the myocardium uh, polymers or hydrogels to alter the remodeling process. And they specifically used the polymer that uh, released recombinant TIM3. And they demonstrated in this paper uh, recently published in Science Translational Medicine that they had a, sort of a sustained release of, of locally of TIMP3 and that they had, a, uh, they had uh, pigs that were infarcted, pigs that were infarcted true to a polymer, and pigs that were infarcted true to a polymer that released TIMP3. And they showed that those that got the polymer that released TIMP3 did the best, had the less, least LV dilatation. Uh, had improved function and decreased infarct size. And they also demonstrated uh, a number of uh, alterations at the tissue level in MMP9 and the TIMPs as well as sort of inflammatory markers. So uh, demonstrating that they were able to deliver this and have the biological effect that they desired and the, the, the outcome. So now we repeated that study uh, in collaboration with those investigators to see if we could use our MMP imaging to track this therapeutic intervention. So we again 
uh, uh, looked at uh, pigs with a lateral wall infarct, and at the time of the infarct, they're injected with either saline uh, with a polymer or with a polymer that releases TIM3. And then we did 3D echo, SPECT, CT, and then tissue analysis. Uh, <clears throat> we found there was no uh, real difference in global function based on CINE CT. Um, however, we did see uh, increases in wall thickness and uh, uh, wall function in the infarct zone. And this is just some representative CT images. And then if we looked at uh, the whole heart in three different slices at uh, six different sectors around the heart, uh, and if uh, you can see here uh, the kind of the profile as you go uh, circumferentially around the heart at different slices from, from base to apex. Um, and here is shown the wall thicknesses, uh, and these are the infarct only and the polymer had thicker walls, and if you look at function, actually in the center of the infarct, both therapies actually improve function based on CINE-CT. Um, and then uh, we also looked at MI size, and the infarct sizes were smaller, whether they got just the polymer or the polymer with the uh, TIMP3. Uh, and then we looked at perfusion, and we showed that, in fact, with thallium, that there was an improvement in tissue perfusion. And these are a bullseye plots uh, in, the, in one of the pigs post-MI, one that got the polymer, one that got the polymer with TIM3. And we also saw an, in total inhibition locally of, MMP, uh, of MMPs and a decrease in our MMP-targeted tracer. And I'll show you some pictures. So here are uh, 3D images of a control heart with thallium perfusion. This is an infarcted heart. This is an infarcted heart treated with the hydrogel, and this is infarctal heart treated with the hydrogel uh, that released TIM3. You can see that the perfusion defects are the same, and down here are the MMP maps. And you can see we see MMP activation here in the infarct area and in the atria. But when we, uh, re when we locally delivered TIM3, we totally suppressed MMP activation within the heart. And these are just sort of some 3D movies uh, just demonstrating the distribution. Now, again, these weren't corrected for partial volume here, so you see a little bit of a decrease in the center of the infarct of MMP, but that's probably the partial volume effect. By well counting, that actually was the hottest area. Um, so, so we can generate these 3D maps of MMP activation within the ventricle and the atria, and we hope that we can use this to guide therapeutic interventions. Now, uh, just to prove that it was a local response, we still had marked MMP activation in the surgical wound. We just didn't have MMP activation at, in the myocardium where we locally released the TIM3, uh, as shown here in the MI only and the MI treated with a TIM3 polymer. And this is just the summary data showing uh, sort of the suppression of MMP activity um, and the increase in tissue perfusion now, because of our novel uh, SPECS system, we actually can do dynamic imaging, and we're trying to actually get quantitative blood flows uh, from dynamic thallium images. And this is just an example of the results uh, of a group of uh, infarcted pigs where we use thallium as a quantitative agent to, to get SPECT flows. And we uh, did kinetic modeling and looked at K1 an index of flow, and K2, an index of sort of viability, and showed uh, the appropriate changes in flow and viability in the normal regions and the infarcted regions. So now I've, I've talked about MR, I've talked about SPECT imaging. We're also doing uh, echo imaging to evaluate three uh, remodeling in the heart. Um, and shown here is an example of the echo images. These are 2D images. Uh, in our pigs uh, that were treated with uh, hydrogels uh, that either had the, the TIM3 or didn't. Uh, and again, another method demonstrating the changes in function. And when we quantified that, again, we saw using echo uh, increases in wall thickness, increases in regional function, both circumferential radial strain uh, and in association with increases in perfusion. Now, 
in collaboration with Jim Duncan, electrical engineer at Yale, we're developing uh, a, a radio frequency ap approach to look at 3D speckle tracking in the heart. So speckle tracking is an approach in ultrasound where you look at the backscattered signal and you cross-correlate that textural information from frame to frame to look at the regional deformation within the heart. Now the problem with speckle tracking is that it's sparse. Sometimes the data is good, sometimes the data is bad. So we take that speckle tracking information and we incorporate it with our surface shape tracking information. And so uh, with the two data sets, we can get a very nice comprehensive analysis of regional deformation. So shown here is the speckle tracking, shown here is the surface shape tracking, and then we integrate that into our finite element model to get complex deformations within the heart using 3D echo. And so uh, shown here, I, don't, I couldn't get these movies to play before, this is just a, a endocardial, epicardial surface of the ventricle uh, showing the, the regions of high and low curvature. We can kind of skip this. Um, we'll go back here. So this is interesting. Uh, so these are the uh, speckle information. And, and the one thing that we're doing unique that other people aren't doing is that we're incorporating the phase. So rather than just cross-correlating textual information, we're actually incorporating the phase information in that cross-correlation. And shown here is uh, sort of an illustration of that phase and intensity information uh, in a small region of the heart, the epicardial surface, the endocardial surface. But again, you can see in some of these images, there's dropout. And so we need to have sophisticated models that can account for where the data is good and where the data is bad. And so uh, the, the group at Yale has been working on uh, sort of an approach to integrate this surface tracking and speckle tracking in a comprehensive way uh, to derive regional deformations in the heart. So what we could do with MR, now we can do with 3D echo, and theoretically we could do it at the bedside. Um, and we validated this speckle tracking actually with MR imaging uh, using tagging. Uh, and this just shows uh, baseline strains and strains uh, with the speckle tracking following occlusion and, and the strains associated, uh, derived off the MR images. So we've been able to validate this 3D speckle tracking uh, with uh, 3D MR tagging. So now the other thing uh, we're validating this speckle tracking with is with invasive sonomicrometers, okay? So, so what we've done is we've implanted arrays of sonomicrometers, transit time crystals on the surface of the heart and on the endocardium of the heart. And we've basically created cubic elements and we can watch those cubic elements deform in three dimensional space. So these crystals talk to each other and they have a resolution of 0.02 millimeters and a temporal resolution of 150 to 300 hertz. Uh, and so with high spatial and temporal resolution, one can look at regional deformations. And so then we are looking at the strains from the speckle tracking with the strains from the crystals within those same areas. And so, um, so shown here is uh, again, the, uh, and we put this one cubic array in the central ischemic area, one in the border region and one in a remote area. So now we have uh, three regions where with, with high precision we can compute regional strains. And shown here are the baseline strains in those three areas. And then this is following uh, an LAD occlusion. So one becomes ischemic and then we give dobutamine and we normalize that function. And so we're actually using this as part of an NIH funded project to validate an automated approach for 3D speckle tracking for a dobutamine stress echo. Uh, and the, the first validation is with these implanted crystals. The second validation is with uh, MR tagging. So now the, the we're also, so I, I've kind of showed you how we can map out MMP activation in the heart. But we'd like to have that help us direct therapy. So we've developed a fiber optic catheter that at the end of the tip of the catheter is a, a, a plastic scintillator that can detect local beta radiation. So the idea is that we inject into the patient, 
an F18 labeled compound. It could be F18 deoxyglucose. That's going to localize in the area of inflammation, define the infarct area or the area of inflammation. Or we could use a PET labeled compound that binds to MMPs. So we could locally define where MMPs are. Then we take that catheter, pass it up through the, the uh, groin, through across the aortic valve, touch the surface of the heart, and map out the molecular signal on the surface of the heart. Now, the, the system is equipped with a needle that can be projected out of the end of the catheter. And so then we can locally deliver either stem cells or polymer or drug at the site of activation. And so that's sort of bringing molecular imaging into the interventional suite, mapping out uh, this, uh, mapping out sort of regional activation. And we're developing a number of prototypes that integrate beta sensing with gamma sensing and incorporating different types of needle configurations. We could also do uh, monitor electrical activity with that at the same time. So we can incorporate it into a regular NOGA mapping system. So in addition to NOGA ma mapping, you'd have a molecular map as well. And we validated this, demonstrating that uh, if we put known sources, we're actually detecting the amount of activity that's in those sources. And then we've also put uh, plastic in front of, between the detector and the source to demonstrate that it's pure beta activity that we're sensing. So we have a, a local beta detector that we could use in the interventional lab. So uh, to summarize, uh, I think um, you know, we can integrate targeted molecular imaging with physiologic changes in perfusion and mechanics. We've been combining MMP activation with other markers, and I didn't have time to talk about that, but there are other probes that we could look at. We could look at angiotensin receptors. We could look at ACE. We could look at integrins in combination. We need to develop the quantitative tools, the image processing tools, to actually get quantitative images or quantitative information from these images. And we think that with molecular imaging, we can provide a better understanding of the pathophysiologic processes associated with ischemic injury and post-infarct remodeling, and perhaps improve therapy and heart failure. And, I th and we think that this multimodality imaging will improve our risk stratification and will allow us to uh, evaluate novel therapeutics, whether it be uh, cell therapies or gene therapies or, or polymer therapies that deliver drugs locally. So, and I'd like to acknowledge the large group of people that I work with at Yale, the people in my group in the Translational Imaging Center, uh, Mehran at the VA, our collaborators in cardiology, our collaborators in London, at UPenn, in particular, Frank Spinelli in South Carolina, our collaborators in radiology and bioengineering, and our industrial partners. Thank you. Great, Al, that was superb. Um, and um, we're open to questions, both here and, and across. Um, Bob? Yeah, that was fantastic. It was a real tour de force. Uh, <laughs> I just had a, you know, the whole idea of MMP inhibition in sort of a more global sense with doxycycline in the vasculature, it's been a little fraught with some problems because we actually need some turnover and repair. So. Uh, what are your thoughts about that in the myocardium, you know, sort of the, the double-edged sword of MMP inhibition and, you know, maybe some uh, yes. impaired uh, wound healing? So we, we did early on, I mean, I think that is a concern. So MMP activation is the first step in angiogenesis. And so, uh, and the question is, if you Im inhibited MMPs, would you impair angiogenesis? We actually did uh, do a, a series of studies where we had... Um, uh, MMP knockouts, and then we looked at integrin activation and capillary density. We actually didn't see that impairment in angiogenic response with uh, MMP9 in inhibition anyway. But I think it, it really is, I don't think we know what the right combination is or what MMPs we need to inhibit, but I think really we've been developing sort of the tools to sort of track these therapies. But I think you're right. I, I don't, and, I, and there are different cascades of MMPs that are turned on different times, and, and some things we want to modulate down, and some things we might want to modulate up. And, and I think the molecular imaging will let us understand that in people, potentially. Ernie? Great 
great presentation, both in context and how uh, easily you explain something so tough. So what do you think is the mechanism of reverse remodeling, particularly something like CRT when the patient had an MI a long time ago and now uh, we know the electrical signal is doing more than just uh, electrical activation? Right, so, so my theory on, on CRT is that, uh, is again, it's, it's a function of regional mechanics and flow. And, and it may be remodeling because pacing has been shown to activate MMPs locally. But I think that what happens is that uh, in dyssynchronous hearts, you have, at times when the, the endocardial is supposed to be perfused, you have areas that are contracting, and so you compromise endocardial flow. If you synchronize the heart, you actually, I think, improve endocardial perfusion. Uh, and that the long-term benefit may actually be the changes in in what happens at that microcirculatory level. And so uh, one thing that we'd, we've always talked about doing was doing quantitative PET flows uh, in patients you know, with devices turned off and turned on and see if we could uh, demonstrate uh, that phenomenon. We're also looking at labeled uh, intramyocardial, uh, tech labeled red cells as a way to look at intramyocardial blood volume. And that's another way that you could look at the changes in intramyocardial blood volume with different mechanical interventions. Andy? Is, is there a relationship between MMP activation and degree of interstitial edema? And from a clinical standpoint, in the infarct situation, a uh, relationship between changes in uh, voltage on EKG with what might be predicted as far as recovery? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, edema, you know, tissue edema is an important part of, of sort of that remodeling process and, 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 and that edema or that stiffening of the wall sort of helps promote that. How that affects electrical conduction, I'm not sure. Um, uh, good question. I mean, I think the catheter that we're developing could maybe get at that because we could look at surface voltages in combination with changes in regional MMP. Uh, it really would probably it would best be defined through sort of fusion of multiple images, taking MR images with other types of images and putting them on electrical maps. And people are doing that now. I just I can't give you a specific answer. Um, yeah, all right, let me just ask one question then. So Al, you, you elegantly showed us uh, that when you combine the biogel um, sort of Bioabsorbable biogel in the post infarct model with the, the temp, that the, the addition of temp didn't seem to improve the remodeling process over just the mechanical biogel. And it sort of gets at what Bob was asking earlier is that here we are, you know, looking at all these very, very complex pathophysiologic processes. And in the end, it seems it's just a simple biomechanical scaffolding appears to provide that effect. And, it, and it, I'm asking you the question that. In terms of our immediate therapeutic options, do you think that these inhibiting and supporting pathways um, is too far out, it's just too complex a process, and should we not be focusing on more simple mechanical uh, scaffolds that inhibit remodeling? Yeah, I mean, I think you make a good point. We did see a significant benefit just of the polymer alone, although there were, uh, seemed to be a better improvement in tissue perfusion in the temp 3 although the numbers are small to really tease out a real difference. But I think you're right. The biggest effect was just the mechanical effects. So how are we, is that something we ought to be pursuing? Because remodeling is, I mean, it seems like for infarct therapies, we've kind of hit a threshold and of benefit. And um, do you think that's, is there interest in pursuing that? As yeah, I mean, I think there, are, I think this whole area of polymer delivery is, is sort of a hot area. And the question is, should it be delivered by catheter? Should it be delivered down the coronaries? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the first studies in man were actually giving it down the coronaries. So we have some interesting ideas about those calcium sensitive polymers that actually we're doing pyrophosphate imaging, which is a map of calcium uptake in the heart. And we've shown that 
we can uh, sort of maybe define using sort of old pyrophosphate imaging, when would be the best time to deliver a calcium sensitive polymer? We know that some patients, they peak at about 72 hours, the calcium within the heart, and that about 20% have persistent positivity. And so we might be able to use molecular imaging sort of direct these therapies. All right. It was a wonderful presentation. You covered an enormous amount of material <laughs> in a short amount of time. Um, but one of the things you, you touched on uh, was the remote my myocardium. And, and you mentioned how the perfusion uh, is diminished in the uh, remote myocardium. Uh, the MMP is abnormal there, but it normalizes over time. But the perfusion doesn't. And the microvasculature is altered in the remote myocardium, and, and even the capillaries are, are abnormal in, in the remote myocardium. And so I wonder if, if the quantitative perfusion um, might add more than just looking at MMP. Uh, yeah, I think, so that's interesting. So we've demonstrated that, in fact, uh, when you create ischemia in a territory, uh, you impair, as you dial down a stenosis in ischemic territory, you impair flow reserve but you also impair flow reserve in the remote territories. And it's a pure mechanical effect because as the ischemic area bulges, the non-ischemic area contracts, the timing changes, and now you have contraction during the isovolemic phases when there should be perfusion. And so you actually compromise flow and it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it can happen in immediately. So it's an acute mechanical effect as well as sort of a long-term microvascular effect. But I, I agree. Those are important. We are also looking at integrin activation as a marker of endothelial cell proliferation as another marker in these, in these models. But we haven't really found, uh, the, the big difference between MMPs and these integrins is we don't really see integrin activation in the remote areas of the heart. Uh, we see uh, MMP activation in the remote areas. And so are those changes more a mechanical than a microvascular uh, change? Right, but, but again, the, the capillary structure is altered, uh, so it's not just mechanical, right? And and so I don't know which dominates. Right, right. Probably both. I, I think I think they're both important, and I think the the beauty of of, of the, some of the spec agents that we're using is that we can look at multiple agents at the same time. So we could look at an integrin, we could look at an MMP, and we could look at perfusion. We could all do it simultaneously. Uh, with these new cameras that have CZT detector material, they have very high energy discrimination, so one can do multiple isotopes. And, and Ernie is an expert at this, so. <laughs> well, just, um, I don't see any of our electrophysiologists. I saw them in the audience earlier, um, but just because you covered that area, uh, what are your thoughts? You mentioned that MMP activation and stress levels are particularly high in the left atrial appendage, um, and particularly, or, or is that, and, so, and particularly with, with interest of left atrial appendage yeah. occlusion devices yeah, uh, to I, I'm, treat AFib. But I'm really worried about that, that actually. Um, I, I yeah. think that, that we're going to find that when we clip off the atrial appendage, that long term, we're going to have worse atrial remodeling because we've eliminated the body's ability to kind of adapt to changes in pressure loading. And I think that that long term is going to maybe not prove out to be the best therapeutic intervention. That's just my speculation. Just based on these animal studies that we've done, a lot of the action is in the atrial appendage. And, and there's a reason for that. And if you get rid of it, I think you're going to have remodeling of the body. And I haven't seen that anyone's really addressed that issue in any of the clinical trials. Well, fascinating. Thank you so much, Al, for a wonderful presentation. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.